good evening to everyone welcome to telugu nara radio facebook live on us immigration migration so we are doing every week uh, on wednesday central time 6 pm so please tune and uh, get more information on your your scenario or maybe if you have any topic on us immigration maybe you can connect telugu nara radio facebook live and you can post the question and get more information from attorney lucas so this week we brought a lot of good news and maybe somehow i don't say but uh, yeah, we we have a lot of information this week um we can discuss uh, one by one the main is s386 uh, bill it got approved in senate is a good news but uh, we see the some differences house and senate the version we will ask the questions on s386 bill and get more information wh- where we are and uh, what is the next step for make a uh, good way we will get the more information on that one and uh, get uh, we will try to get the prevailing wages the court already stopped the the latest uh, um let, latest one and uh, so labor department need to updated the os uh, fsc data and uh, you can you can file amendment or extension on the new wages maybe pretty much i checked the flc data pretty much it went back where we previously so it good good news for who are ready to apply the amendment and uh, extension and uh, just uh, got information from the lucas uh, from lucas some president's uh, administration action or something we will get more information on uh, any any point maybe is a good or bad just we will get more information on that uh, welcome lucas welcome every wednesday live show i think thanks to... for thanks thank you for having me hope you had a wonderful week yeah thank you yeah how is this day well is today's a... today's busy we had uh you know uh, the everything go back in in order with uh, department of labor so now uh you know we've been busy filing lcas today you know utilizing the uh the prevailing wage data on cases we were waiting on uh so we could uh, go ahead and have an accurate wage level set uh for the LCA and uh just to touch base i know <clears throat> last week we kind of left the show uh on a little bit of good news uh, uncertainty and and in um uh, speculation about the um uh HR 1044 and S386 and uh unfortunately it looks like you know uh, a lot of uh jockeying is going on within Congress and it's more likely that this is probably not going to come to pass uh is is you know sad as that seems uh, I know a lot of people have a lot of my clients uh, we've all discussed this and and have been uh hoping for something positive to happen along these lines for a year and a half or so now and um you know it's unfortunate that this is kind of where you know this this bill kind of goes to to uh die uh but pretty much what happened uh, just to explain it in in layman's terms that you know the house which is uh, one of the member uh, chambers of congress uh pass you know the bill and the bill went to the senate now the senate can review and debate put it in committee whatever they want to do and then they can also make amendments or changes that they see fit and and then uh if the changes are significant then it goes back to you know the house and then the house can vote on those changes or you know maybe vote on a few approve some and then uh make you know other changes and send back to the senate you know and then if everything's passed at that point it would go to the president for signature to become law now what um happened is there were significant changes to that legislation so s uh, uh 386 pretty much omitted 
uh, a large section of the EB categories based upon a nationality, specifically for Chinese nationals. And there is quite a bit of a backlog for Chinese nationals with the EB-5 investment category and with, you know, the Senate trying to limit or not apply, you know, the reduction of the backlog for these visas uh, for Chinese nationals. Um, obviously, the House is not going to go forward with that. And in the middle, unfortunately, it's a lot of our colleagues and clients that are Indian nationals who are seeking EB-2, EB-3 uh, visas. So. You know, as the page turns, so to speak, <clears throat> there's also good news on the horizon. Uh, like what Venkat and I have been speaking about for the past two months, you know, with the new administration, it, one of the top plans, aside from, you know, uh, curing this public pandemic is going to be comprehensive immigration reform. And one of the, the ways that we can apply this would be you know, Congress could say we don't like so many people on a backlog or so many people tied up with certain, you know, H-1B visas or, or any other status. And, you know, they should have an easier path to citizenship that doesn't take a lifetime. And, you know, so Congress could very easily, you know, issue one million visas to address the backlog. They could um, have any other type of program in involved where, hey, you have a an approved I-140, but the visa is not available, something like this, you could go ahead and get EAD. There's many different things that can happen, uh, any of which would probably be, would be better than what we have right now. So, uh, you know, that's something to look forward to. So uh, it's kind of good news and bad news at the same time. Okay. Lucas, just uh, we, we can discuss about the bill. So this is uh, almost uh, pending from last two years. It approved in July, uh, July 2019 and uh, the House, it sitting in Senate till December 3rd. And December 3rd, all Senate got a uh, unanimous vote for the bill and got approved, but uh, it amended maybe one or two points. Here we need to understanding uh, do you explain what are the difference uh, version in the Senate and House? Can you give the uh, point by point where it, it got, uh, uh, why they, it means the first question is why they got amendment, the new points in the Senate? Well, so Al president, already, um, yeah, you, you can give the step by step. So maybe we can ask in between if any, uh, any questions. Yeah, go ahead. So pretty much um, not only just in this bill that, you know, the Senate, you know, uh, amended and, and passed. President Trump also has signed executive orders um, limiting the, you know, the, the ability for anyone from Chinese origin who's a member of the military or uh, been a member of any specific party uh, in the past from me being able to come here legally or you know, uh, file their case. And, and there's a, you know, a, a large swath of uh, people affected by that, that, you know, was pretty much an unfair um, attempt at an executive order, similar to maybe what's happened in the past with, you know, this proclamation uh, for COVID-19, uh, you know, from the White House that has, you know, quite a few people stuck back home. Because they, you know, they can't travel back here on an H-1B visa because of the pandemic, uh, you know. So he's kind of used the pandemic there to limit who can come back in our country. Um, so this is kind of the same circumstances where he's he's set the tone uh, to exclude some Chinese nationals, and then the Senate also carrying the same uh, message from the president. That, you know, they've pretty much. Uh, made it very difficult for any anyone of Chinese uh, origin to to go ahead and uh, or Chinese national to go ahead with and, and benefit from this uh, uh, S-386 bill. So, you know, a lot of it is um, pretty much done. Uh, we call it fairness for high skilled workers, but at the same time, it's not fair in the sense of what was done uh, by excluding one entire group. So if you can imagine you know, we have uh, the reverse happening where we say, you know, we don't appreciate things that are going on 
uh, world politics right now, global politics with uh, maybe India, uh, Prime Minister Modi or something. And then the president says, well, we'll go ahead and pass this bill, but we need to exclude anyone of Indian origin. So by doing this, it doesn't mean any, everyone of Indian origin is affiliated with Modi or supporting that or anything else. So it's kind of, uh, it's an unfair, more or less like a xenophobic or racist uh, message that they're sending, uh, excluding these people just because of where they're from. Okay. So only uh, the two version as a House and Representative, the point is uh, excluding a couple of countries in that it, it added a, a new point to exclude the maybe some of the segments, maybe government officials or maybe army officials or maybe some background. Correct. So, so in this case, uh, Senate got amendment. Now it is the bill uh, sent back to the House, right? Right. So this will brought uh, by Mike, Mike, uh, my sponsor is Mike. The, what is the current situation and what is the possibility to get uh, passed in house in current scenario? It means uh, the current government, maybe the current, uh, the house, maybe will run by only uh, till 14 or uh, 18. After that, we know the Christmas holidays or maybe session is out. So, can you give the more little uh, more information on this one? How the how houses uh, take it this bill and uh, take a necessary action? Uh, well, can you see it? yeah, that, that's a good point. And like you said, we have limited time, so there's a lot of moving pieces happening right now in Washington that, uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, are more important than you know reevaluating this bill. Um, you know, for one, the, the government has to approve a budget so we can stay, the government can stay open, uh, you know, for the short term period. Um, and, and then secondly, there's a lot of discussion now where these House Republicans want to uh, bring some sort of uh, forum or discussion to the, the House floor after the Electoral College has, has been uh, uh you know, uh, posted or issued, you know, and the votes counted, they want to go ahead and have an open forum debate about uh, this voter fraud that they, the, the Republicans are uh, alleging and things like this. So there's a lot of other events, not getting into too, too much detail, that are going to take up a lot of time um, and, and might have more important um, short-term effect as far as what our current uh, events uh, are we have right now. So, uh, unfortunately, I think it, unfortunately, but fortunately, I think, you know, like I said, early next year, the first 100 days of the president, I think is going to be best in, in the terms of uh, addressing the comprehensive immigration reform, because this bill, as good as it was getting rid of the backlogs, uh, and the quotas, it, it's not an immediate remedy, right? So this is something that takes years you know, to fully take advantage of it, depending on what your priority date is. So it could be many years before something like this would be beneficial. So, you know, it, being optimistic, we could say that hopefully there's something better that can come after this, uh, which I think is you know, pretty, pretty much certain that it's going to happen. Okay. The Lucas, you are saying is uh, Biden um, will vote on January 20 after that, the under days. And you keep saying as a Biden will bring the comprehensive immigration system. This comprehensive immigration system, the, how does it uh, uh, step in? Is it executive action or maybe maybe is a the same Senate and the House and uh, the path is Senate, House and President and by law. How does it work, this comprehensive and work, bring to become a law? So, you know, traditionally, and of course, tradition's gone out the window these past four years. But traditionally, uh, what we want to see is a president be a leader where they set forth agenda. Uh, so the president will say, I want to do uh, accomplish X policy. The proper way of achieving this policy is for the House of Representatives to start, draft a bill, discuss, debate, put it to committee, 
advance to the Senate, have more discussion debate because all the constituents uh, in the United States would be represented would be represented through this process. Uh, so we, it's a fair debate forum, things like this, for us to to have a fair, proper, um, you know, procedure for for laws to pass. Then once the Senate finishes this, the president would sign it into law, and that would be the law of the land, and that would be the most uh, uh, ideal way of doing things. Now, having said that, that's not always going to happen, especially today where there's so much partisanship uh, and disagreement. What we would say is, uh, in that case, and this is the tools that President Trump has used, we would you know, maybe issue rules, do a rulemaking process to change some regulations within the agency that's not outside the scope of what the law might be. Uh, that would be one. We could use executive action, which obviously this president's used a lot of uh, in terms of immigration. So when we say comprehensive immigration reform, we're not just focusing on employment-based backlog. We're not just focused on uh, children who are separated from their parents at the border. We're not focused on just asylum. or anything. We, we want to address everything as a whole. And the best way of doing this is to have proper debate, discussion, and a plan. And that's why I believe one way or the other, um, you know, w something is, is going to happen. The most recent um, major, I think, uh, legislation that came about this way would have been the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, uh, under President Obama, or what people refer to as Obamacare. So, you know, he, he set out when he was president, the first thing on his agenda was saying, I want, you know, affordable health care for the American people. Uh, he went to the House, the House put something together, then they went to the Senate, they passed it, uh, and he signed it into law. And that, that's traditionally, you know, the, the ideal way of uh, conducting policy or procedure within, you know, the, the United States. Okay. Lucas, so we can step back on uh, bills S386. So, a fast couple of years, I mean, a lot of people done campaign rallies and uh, send emails to the Senate and House of Representatives and campaign on the e phone called it means call uh, the Senate and requested to and uh, understanding build it meant, <coughs> excuse me, lost uh, uh, from July maybe July to 2019 to December 2020 we requested to the Senate and House to Advance uh, unblock this S386. So in current situation, we have the limited time. If you if you want to do the email campaign or maybe request it to the senators and uh, House of Representatives, uh, can you give it means how does it work and uh, how move forward to get become a law? Uh, I mean, you would always, the representatives always want to hear from the constituency, right? So even though you can't, most people in this situation cannot vote, uh, you still live in an area, in a district, you, you know, you pay taxes, you're a member. And, and this goes back to, you know, what I was saying also before uh, about, you know, a lot of, uh, especially H1 workers work in a professional environment and a professional atmosphere side by side with American workers. And, you know, it doesn't hurt sometimes to share that conversation with a colleague saying, you know, look, this is kind of uh, where things are. This is how the system's broken. These are things to, they can help uh, and get people, other people involved or educated about the issues. Um, but like I said, you know, traditionally in a normal setting, that would be what we want to do. We want to, uh, contact Congress. AILA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, has a, a day of, of action where, you know, we'll go up to our representative's office in, in D.C. and, you know, you anyone can go there and, and they'll, the representatives will receive uh, anyone and uh, if they're in office, obviously. And, um, you know, you can share your, your thoughts and frustrations or comments with, with with them and, and let them know how this is an important issue. So a lot of these things can be done. You can do it via email or phone call or 
anything. And, and, and um, at the end of the day, going back to the current situation right now, as you brought up and mentioned, you know, we only have, you know, maybe a week, week and a half uh, before this, you know, um, the, the Christmas holidays and the, the New Year. So, I, you know, depending on what happens with the budget, uh, keeping the government open in the short term is, you know, that that's really significant. And there's other just as significant issues going on right now that are probably going to prevent uh any any movement on this this one bill okay so it was um the f s386 bill in senate uh, it all of a sudden and come up and approved uh, in senate right so we hopefully uh the same situation happen in the house and get uh, approved let's say the house is approved the bill hr 1044 and before December 14, the what is the next step? It it's sent to the president. So yes, president, but, president it, it, also yes. is a is a uh, is a limit time. The January uh, 20. I don't know if January till he work on January 20 or not. The what is a step if approve the HR 1044? Well, I mean, he was signed into law, but none of this is going to happen. It's pretty much. Uh, um, the, the whole situation is going to be shelved. And with a new administration, like what we were saying last week, we have what we call now, um, you know, a period of where we call the lame duck, where important legislation like this isn't going to be uh, passed. Because if you can imagine, if I was a, a congressman and I lost an election, it's really not proper for me to pass more legislation because the voters have spoken and want a different person representing them. So it would be you know, pretty much unethical for me to go ahead and, and keep pushing through laws. That's why there's really nothing that's going to happen other than emergency uh, legislation, such as, you know, the budgets and things like that to keep government running. So uh, I don't want to be, you know, the bearer of bad news, but pretty much there's no, uh, you know, the current situation for the foreseeable future, there's really nothing that's going to happen with this bill. Okay. So I saw those one time as a Omni, omnibus bill. Okay. Do you know the what is the omnibus bill? So yes. So what that goes through as far as reviewing uh, the regulations that are changing, uh, they you know that office will review and make sure everything's done uh, as far as like the rules and comments and things like this before a new regulation's passed. Is that what you're referring to for like some of these rulemaking procedures and provisions? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, you said it when you explained uh, S three eighty six bill the current status. Is there anything you want to share on this one? Or no, I think we pretty much summarized everything. It's is pretty much. I know there's been a lot of uh, pushing and supporting and um, you know discussion, positive things that have happened supporting this bill. But unfortunately, at the end of the day. This this version of what we want to happen did not pass. Now, we don't want to be uh, pessimistic where we we get too sad about this because um, I, I really believe this next year we're going to see something that's going to be even better than this S three eighty six come through. That's going to benefit the backlog and everyone who's stuck in H one B status at the moment. Okay, that is a good news for all backlog H one holders. OK, next uh, we come up, uh, we come to the. Prevailing wages and the uh, specialty occupation and. Uh, limited approval. Last week, the code got stopped the uh, recent changes and. Uh, I think uh, I saw the FLC. Uh, data got changed pretty much is back to the, the previous uh, wages. So. Are you are you filing the new LCS based on the new the recent changes or can you give me more information on that one? Correct. So the just like any system, uh, the way we file LCAs, uh, there's a front end that works where we input the data and uh, it actually pulls the front end pulls from the database, the back end, the data. And so it took, you know, DOL a few days 
to make sure all the everything is working properly for this uh, function to work because uh, I can't in the past we could manually uh, in the iCERT system we could go ahead and in input our own prevailing wage amounts uh, reference that from OFC data just you know and we could input any num number we chose but with this new flag system uh, we're not able to manually input the data based on uh, OES data so um, it took a little bit of time for that to come back but mentioning what you brought up about the IFR the interim final rule for DOL and DHS okay so yes a, a judge just so we all understand the process and procedures uh, a judge in Northern California and the, in San Francisco, uh, a federal judge went ahead and struck down the rule, uh, not on the substance alone, looking at it saying, well, you can't raise the wages this much or you can't impact H-1Bs to only one year. They, that wasn't part of the discussion. The, the injunction, the lawsuit that was filed on this was saying, you know, look, government, you did not follow the correct procedures to change our rule. So we didn't receive any notice and comment period to even know that you were going to plan on changing this. You didn't listen to any comments we have about how this could adversely affect business. And in doing that, uh, the government relied on this as saying, look, this is a public emergency because of COVID-19, the economy's been hurt, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the, the proper rules and provisions under the, the, um, administrative uh, law, uh, APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, that did not, were not followed. So the judge basically said, because you didn't follow your own rules, uh, this, is, this is not applicable. You have to go back to the way things were. Now, having said that, this administration, our president and his top officials have kind of packed everything this last few months of his administration to do damage to our system. So they've you know, there's, I have a executive branch uh, rules that are in process. I mean, there, it, it, it covers everything from immigration court to different types of visas, uh, H-1B programs, everything. And, and all of these rules are very difficult for a future president to come and undo. So some of the rules are out and following the correct process, the rulemaking process, um, uh, one of which uh, I, I did respond with a comment during the comment period for the proposed changes for the uh, H-1B uh, cap process where this new rule is looking to pretty much it's, it's, it's pretty much an auction block. Whoever's going to pay the H-1B worker the highest has preference to be selected rather than just a lottery. So, you know, it, we're running up against a clock to maybe have something done to delay this process until the new administration comes in on January 20th where they can still stop this. So that's really what Trump's been doing. So the IFR, the interim final rule that was done and uh, was wonderfully challenged in court by, by a few, quite a few other attorneys, um, you know, that helped buy enough time to where hopefully, uh, you know, cause the government still has the option to put this rule through comment period and things like this and become a final rule. But the clock, the timeline for them to get this done is pretty much uh, not in their favor. So, you know, um, I guess to sum everything up, you know, there's still a possibility for the government could still pursue these changes. Uh, but, you know, they would have to go through the correct process and there might not be enough time left for them to do so. But there's many other changes they're still trying to get through and push. Okay. So you, you're saying is the Trump administration is imposing new rules on executive events with the execution orders. You said already one is a cap on um, the new rule. Is only one thing on H1 or is any, can you share if you have more? Just so, to understand which it means H1 portion of who are impacting by this new rules. So the proposed rule would pretty much impact anyone who's going through the cap registration process. So as we all know, uh, uh, traditionally you would file, everyone would file a petition and then USCIS would randomly select those petitions. Um, and, and then, you know, you would have a case and 
once your case is approved, you're in H-1B status. Uh, this last year was the first year where we used this registration tool that uh, an employer has to pre-register the employee and then they're randomly selected electronically, and then we could submit the petition. Now, I don't know how the changes would would work in this scenario without revamping the system, uh, since we don't file LCAs at the time we do the registration. Uh, but basically, this new rule would say, look, what's the wage rate that's going to be paid? Well, um, you know, like here in Dallas, uh, for software developer, level two, a wage rate's typically right at just under $94,000 a year. So would that mean I want to file like a level four wage and pay 122, 130, when whatever it is, and then the higher the higher wage, you know, is selected. So I I don't know how they would implement that to be um, fair. I guess I would say, and and if there's going to be any type of uh, uh, scale like what uh, Department of Labor already uses, where you know, obviously the living wage and the expenses in the Bay Area are much higher than here in Dallas, which is much higher than Nebraska. So you have to take all, you know, 120000 in each of those places does not equal the same amount of money. Uh, so, you know, we have to figure out, like, what what is the system? How would it be implemented? How would it impact the current system we use? You know, so it, hopefully we have enough time before it won't go into – become uh, a final rule but we you know that that one's the most worrisome uh of all at the moment yeah okay so let's say that trump uh, bring the new rule by the execution order the what is the chance to stop by biden administration after See, so january 20. therein lies the issue that's what we've been discussing um once the proper procedures are followed for the rulemaking process, uh, it's really difficult for someone to come back and, and change that rule. So obviously the most straightforward, easy way to, to make the change would be for Congress to update the law or the code or do something in that regard and pass it into law. I guess the new administration could also propose a new rule change. Uh, but then, you know, there, there's issues with that process as well. So uh, unilaterally, the president just can't go in and say, I don't like this rule and take it away. It has to, you know, there's more to it than that. So that's why these executive orders, uh, like the ban on travel, uh, getting H-1B visas stamped and things like this, you know, President Biden, uh, first day in office, he can unilaterally cancel that. May, you know, that, that's history. And then he can allow, you know, people to get stamped and come back in the country. Uh, so that an executive order is very easy to do in that regards, but these rule changes are somewhat more permanent and it's more difficult to change. And that's why uh, there's been a lot of uh, angst in our community because there's so many rules that affect pretty much every facet of immigration law group, and, and many different types of uh, social groups or nationalities are, are heavily affected. And uh, there's just real, really not enough attorneys on hand to challenge every single provision they're trying to change. So, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, touch wood that everything will be fine. And, uh, you know, we can move forward on January 20th. Yeah, I about to ask uh, the same statement just to already told that. Uh, is there any option to challenge the uh, by attorney to stop this new rules? Oh, yeah, we can. You know, there, there's different challenges that can be done. So obviously, until uh, we have something in our in, in our legal context that we would like to say that an issue has to be ripe, okay? And ripe means like a piece of fruit where you can select the fruit. You don't pick uh, the fruit when it's still green, or and you don't pick the fruit fruit after it's you know rotten. It has to be right in the, the middle for it, it. The issue is right now impacting and there's harm that can, that is done or could be done uh, to a certain individual or group of people. So when we say this, just because of, you know, President Trump uh, puts one of these rules in, in process, if one of these rules, um, let's just say hypothetically, never impacts anyone or doesn't have any harm to anyone, 
it's hard for us to go to a court and challenge that rule because there's no actual harm or there's no ability for actual harm to be shown. So in, in that sense, the, the, it's not a ripe uh, lawsuit for consideration. So there's, there's, when, we, when we have these lawsuits over these rules that are, that are made, uh, we don't have to wait for any harm to happen. We can, we can say, look, you violated procedures, and yes, people are going to be harmed. And these are the groups of people that would have been affected. And based upon you know, this very straightforward process uh, outlined by law, you know, we can request an injunction, which means a suspension of the application of that rule. So in the sense of these final rules, like with the IFR, that's more of a straightforward challenge. Um, when we get after the rules are established and it's past that point and the proper procedures are followed, it's more difficult to have a, a court challenge. It doesn't mean we can't do it. It just it's more difficult for that process to really come about. Okay. So this this is a, a totally impacted whoever seeking the H one the first time, right? Correct. This no right. So this pretty much. A, it impacting to the master students who pursued in United States. So do you have any information that any limitation of the employment? Let's say uh, some of rules, we saw that the below 50 and yeah. the above 50, right? Do you have any information on that one? If employee ha em employ employer have the 50 employees, less than 50 employees and more than 50 employees? Will this uh, rule categorize by this or something? Do you uh, have any information on that? So the the, the are you in discussing the 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 fee increase because you have more than fifty employees and they're more than half in H one B? The same likely it means uh, the I new rule. Read, I haven't read fully through the new rule in the sense of how the the being H-1B dependent or having more than 50 employees, if, if that's the case, then yes, that would that could very well impact, uh, you know, if, if what we would call, you know, a consultancy firm that might have a few hundred people, uh, most of which are in H-1B status. So, yes, that could impact them if, if they have that provision in there. Correct. Okay. Okay, so just um, we can go for the next uh, question on H one B. You it means we know the October eight, October eight, it got the new wages level. The whoever applied between the October eight and December third, maybe December four, um, will they get the three years extension or one year? What is the limitation of approval? You saw. Very good question. So there's a very important distinction to be made here. We have the IFR interim final rule that was passed. Now it's for two different agencies. One was uh, Department of Labor. One was Department of Homeland Security. So the the one that affect that was potentially going to affect the approval duration was for Department of Homeland Security, which USCIS falls under that umbrella. So that rule wasn't really uh, in effect until, you know, the it was supposed to go into effect uh, last week on the 8th or the 7th, I think, um, or this week. And uh, anyway, the DOL rule from October 8th is the one that uh, affected the wage levels. So uh, in the sense that you have an LCA filed uh, during that period, you can, uh, obviously you can, uh, the employer can file or the attorney can file for redetermination of that uh, LCA wage rate, you know, so the proper wage levels can be assigned with the proper uh, prevailing wage data. So an employer can do this, they can, or they can leave the LCA designation the same as it is right now, or you could file a new LCA and then file a new case to go with that, an amended case uh, with the appropriate wage levels. So there's few different options that are available for that. Okay. Okay. So, so I think it still is H4 EDs are in delay process. 
do you have any information on that one? Well, you know, I, I get these questions all the time and a lot of people get to despair. I mean, we can still do an expedite request. Um, and there's other people that, uh, you know, will try and uh, get a group of people together and maybe file a lawsuit or something like this to expedite the process. Um, and then obviously the third option would be that USCIS has the ability from this most recent CARES Act uh, provision that was passed by Congress to, to increase premium processing and include H4 EAD. Um, you know, I, to be honest with you, I mean, I don't know uh, what the best course of action is for this. I think all three are probably uh, limited at best as far as what's going to happen. I think that the most uh, probable way of fixing this issue is going to be, you know, maybe removing the biometrics requirement for H4. Uh, and in that way, if uh, a spouse is filing H4 and H4 EAD with the principal H1 immigrant, then if that's principal immigrant, H1B immigrant chose uh, premium processing, then we could go back to the way things were for the H4 and H4 EAD would also be processed much faster because it'd be grouped together without, you know, in this biometric requirement, causes the cases to more or less be split. And that's what's causing a lot of this uh, backlog and, and uh, a lot of these problems with the delay in issuing the, the cards. Okay. So already we discussed about the biometric. Will Biden will remove this biometric process to for it? I, I, I hope so, because there's been, I mean, biometrics are, are a wonderful tool and are required on a lot of what we we use here, you know, to make sure the public is safe. In that sense, I mean, we I think someone has to really look at the data and say, you know, hey, how many criminals have we, you know, apprehended, or how many terrorists have we apprehended who are in H four status versus, you know, some other visa category or or some other process that to, you know, where they would use the biometrics, and I think. Uh, freeing up the system where we're pretty much issuing the biometrics responsibly, I, I think that's the solution to help speed up the process. Now, um, I don't know, you know, what they can do other than, you know, maybe just suspending it for, for certain visa categories, but uh, that's what I would recommend. I think that they probably need to look at the data, and I, I don't know the data myself, but I would imagine there's probably not very many people who are criminals uh, in H4 status. And, you know, the need for the, and especially this year with COVID-19, the need to expose and risk uh, someone's health for that. Um, I even have one client um, that has a special needs uh, child. And, you know, of all things, this this child, they, they try to go and help uh, have biometrics done in the, in, the, the the person's uh, child w wouldn't put a mask on and it, it was very stressful and they were became distraught. So there's a whole other provision now where uh, USCIS is going to have to maybe do a, a, a house visit, you know, for, for this, uh, for the kid. And at, at the end of the day, I mean, that's just, to me, it's unnecessary. I don't know why you would have to put someone through this, this process whenever obviously that, the, that kid, it's probably not a risk to the community. Okay. Lucas, we got a question in uh, Facebook by Aravind. The same about, about H4 EAD delays. The California service center process take 15 to 18 months. Uh, he's asking question as premium process for the H4 EAD. Do you think new administration going to be resolved these issues? It's possible. Uh, that's a very good question. I think you know, you have to look at things uh, hand in hand, you know, so Congress uh, provided the president or the administration the ability to increase normal premium processing fees. Uh, uh, now they're twenty five hundred dollars. Now, just most of all of us know and all the viewers know that USCIS is not funded by Congress. Everything that's you know used for their operations is 100 percent derived from uh, filing fees. So, you know, we. You're, the government's supposed to responsibly look at this and say, you know, what are the fees required to do the work? 
Okay. We're not trying to make a profit off of anyone here. We're just trying to make sure we cover our expenses. Uh, and, and that's, you know, part of the process, uh, of what we need to do. So if there is a legitimate expense or a legitimate need for that, you know, hopefully this administration can study that and say, yes, we made that determination, or maybe we, we don't need biometrics, uh, to burden the system and remove that requirement for certain people. Right. So hopefully there's some change because, uh, the current processing of four to six months is just not appropriate, especially when, uh, someone cannot work on H4 EAD without the actual approval in their hand. Okay, thank you. So all viewers, uh, just I'm request, requesting if you have any question, you can post now. Uh, we will take it up your question and uh, discuss with attorney. Lucas, uh, we got another question by Navneet. He is asking about what are the chances of S386 bill being approved in the Senate? I think uh, yeah, you can take it on this. Well, it was already approved uh, in the Senate, but now it has to go back to the House, and the House would have to approve the changes the Senate made for it to advance. And, you know, as we discussed, it's pretty much, uh, you know, not going to happen. Uh, you know, I, like what we discussed at the start of the show, I, I think that there's a higher probability that uh, we have a better package that comes through that's going to help you know, immediately impact this backlog we have for uh, EB2, EB3 uh, categories from India. Uh, and, I, I, you know, like I said, hopefully, you know, a lot of people, we, you know, this past October, we were able to file adjustments and get, get that process moving. And hopefully, you know, that something can be done in legislation to speed that up to where more people can file or at least get EAD uh, because they've had an I-140 for, you know, three years and the visa is not available, you know, so Congress can come up with any sort of action plan, not just remove the backlog. Okay. So just you, you bring the I-140. Somewhere else I saw is maybe a new bill or maybe um, maybe S-386 bill is bringing the new, new one is if anyone have I-140 approved beyond the two years, they can eligible to apply the 485. Do you have the more information? It means I don't have the much information I didn't get, but can you explain if you have it? Sure. I mean, that that's one of the provisions, like what I just said, that, you know, it's a creative process. We can come up with many different resolutions to fix the problem. Um, that's not what I would say is the top of my list, but that's better than uh, our current situation. We don't want you know, people be tied into H ones uh, when they don't need to be. Uh, we would prefer that um, if you know if people want to move here and have it be a legal permanent resident, that they can have a at least a foreseeable future where they can plan for that future. We don't want people to to be stuck here without an ability to move forward. And you know, like I said, I think it. it this next year, the worst case scenario, I think, is going to be what you just discussed as far as, uh, you know, of all the positives and, and, and things that we can hope for, probably at the bottom of that list is going to be, you know, hopefully, you know, if you have an I-140 and it's been pending for two years and the visa's not available, you can go ahead and get EAD and file for adjustment. So hopefully, you know, we have something like that at the minimum uh, where we can move forward. Okay. I think pretty much we discussed what are the topics uh, we want to discuss today. Just uh, I want to check with you. Are you started a preparation for the cap for next year? What are the steps? Uh, well, you know, steps are going to be similar to this last year in the sense that we get lists from the employers, um, you know, with the passport information, the beneficiary's uh, name, if it's a master cap, regular cap, their date of birth the country of origin and then you know pretty much everything's filed electronically online for that process now if this new rule comes into place the system would have to change and and i don't know uh this last system took six plus months of design and testing uh to be implemented and i, and I don't know if the government can move that fast to implement this new rule so just because we have the rule and it's there uh doesn't necessarily mean the 
agency would have, you know, would, would have it uh, as being used immediately uh, just because uh, there, there's certain practical circumstances that have to, that would have to be taken care of first before we could even uh, go that route. Right. Okay. So pretty much whatever the, we, we follow the last year, the same process will go for 2021 cap process. I, I believe so because it, if most people don't have access to the the system, only attorneys and employers would. Um, in in the secure portal that we use to file these cases, uh, there's just simply no way we can input information at the moment for LCAs. There's no way to link an LCA to a registration. There's no way for us to input any fields for wages. Uh, and like I said. You know, if you're working at, if you're in clients like um, Facebook or eBay and you're working in the Bay Area, you know, level two wage puts you at 120 something thousand dollars. But if you're in uh, Iowa and Des Moines, Iowa for the same job and the same wage level, that wage, the actual wage, I think is like 82,000. So there's a discrepancy there. And just by saying that the higher bidder gets the visa is not a, it's not fair because uh, there has to be some calculation or, or an adjustment made to know, um, you know, it, who, who's going to uh, be factored fairly uh, as far as being chosen because, you know, be, paying someone in Iowa 90,000, but the Bay area person making 120, actually the person in Iowa is getting a higher wage uh, as per how it's, you know, working with the prevailing wage. So, I mean, you know, we, there's a lot of things we'd have to look at and see how it's going to be implemented, uh, to be fair, because we, we can't have anything that's, uh, arbitrary or capricious that it that applies to the system. It has to be fair for everyone. Okay. So pretty much we discussed, uh, to the topics, um, uh, I'm requesting if you have any questions, uh, we can take it up now uh, or else we can close in within a few minutes. You can post in in Facebook comments. We will take the questions. Yeah, Lucas, uh, we hope uh, you, you keep saying is uh, Biden will bring the new comprehensive bill that will help to in maybe instant uh, F, uh, instant um, to the all H1 holders or maybe backlog uh, green card process the o4 you, you keep saying that is a comprehensive bill is better than the s386 uh, bill mm -hmm. so hopefully biden after january 20 january 20 maybe we will see the 100 days plan to bring this new bill hopefully everyone will get green card and uh, they can yeah they can start new life actually <laughs> well i mean you know, say <laughs> A lot of organizations, and I'm sure, you know, the I've worked with a few other wonderful organizations that you know represent Indians uh, from, especially from South India, uh, as far as like the American Telugu Association, I think is what it is, um, and a few other associations. So the, the more people that get involved and share information and, and what we need to do for change, the better. Um, Aila is already you know, put together hundred page, you know, notes, I guess, or commentary as far as what would comprehensive immigration reform look like for everyone and how, what are the ideas we want to really move forward in advance to fix problems. So, you know, obviously the more, the more, uh, activity we have from members in the community, the better off it is. So, you know, we'll, we'll try and, uh, look as we move forward and see, you know, if things keep progressing this way, hopefully we can, maybe coordinate with some of the uh, community leaders and see if we can, you know, just like the community came together for uh, S384, you know, hopefully we can do the same for any future comprehensive immigration reform and make sure voices are heard. So that's something hopefully we can do early in the next year. Okay. okay. So, yeah, we are, maybe we can end the show. Maybe you can show apart from this, whatever we'll discuss, if you have any more mind. Uh, I think, you know, we're getting close to the end of the year. Um, Want to make sure everyone, you know, stays safe uh, this this holiday season. Uh, have a happy new year. 
and uh, you know, we'll continue to be here to to help support anything that might come up. So next week we'll have another uh, weekly show at six o'clock. And you know, as always, you know, try and let your friends know uh, that we have this forum and. Uh, it would make me happy as long as, as well as Venkat happy if we had, you know, maybe an open show where we just answered just uh, questions from our viewers. So, you know, hopefully we can uh, maybe next week have a platform where we just have an open forum uh, and have people call in or, or send messages for important issues that they would like addressed. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Lucas, actually joining today every week Wednesday session, live session. And also very thankful to uh, viewers is tuning to the Telugu NRA Radio Facebook Live on immigration system. And you thank for Arvind and Navneet, your post. So here we are ready to help to the community give on more, uh, maybe accurate information on the immigration system. So you can come up with your question or scenario, maybe your friend let know this platform and uh, they can post their questions and scenario. Lucas is ready to help to you. Uh, maybe I, I can say is that utilize this platform and get more information on US immigration system. So thank you. Thank you very much to join today. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Lucas, I'm signing off from Houston. The Lucas is Lucas from Dallas. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening and good night.